Gotcha. This this was a scene we did when the famous drag queen Mar Mario Montez died. Uh, we staged an exhibition honoring him at USC in Los Angeles. And so this, this was the zine for that opening. Um, this is the zine I did for when I opened the punk workshop and uh, the punk symposium in Cornell in the fall. And that's a conversation between me and John Savage and the science fiction author William Gibson trying to figure out what the fuck it all meant. The answer is we have no idea. Um, this was when uh, we sold the punk magazine archive to Yale University uh, to celebrate that. We did this zine together with the artist John Holmstrom mm -hmm. and he modified every single copy. Okay. But this was also for free. This wasn't for sale. This mm -hmm. was like anybody who showed up to the party got one. Yeah, that's what I like about zines is that yeah. they're Everyone puts a lot of attention, but yet they remain simple somehow. And yeah, yeah. And they're not. It's not necessary to sell them. No, no, yeah. no. It's the point, not. The point is, to and make it's them. also kind of whack to sell them. Yeah, you know, it's like in. I prefer in, to in, trade them. Well, in punk and in science fiction, uh, zines were always traded. And the interesting thing is, of course, that the roots of zines comes from science fiction and horror fandom in the nineteen in the early nineteen hundreds, in the nineteen twenties, and nineteen thirties where you know people who couldn't who couldn't find kindred spirits in any other way looked at the letter pages of science fiction magazines to get addresses and then they mimeographed little commentaries on science fiction and horror and swapped those back and forth through the mail and you know as a parallel to that you see like early radical political zines uh usually on the left or anarchism you see radical sexual zines you know lesbians gay men and so forth so it becomes a peer-to-peer -peer com communication network. And then after World War II, because you know the war effort uh, produced so many mimeographs, because the mimeograph printer was used for war logistics, for you know printing invoices or printing like inventory lists or whatever. So there would be used mimeographs costing next to nothing in like every thrift store in America. So the whole like poetry, the mimeo poetry boom of post World War II was just because of the, the necessity of these being really, really cheap and really easily, easily accessible. And, you know, printing offset didn't even make financial sense until you printed at least like a thousand copies. So it is, it has to do with addition size, but it also has to, addition, has to do with like access points to technology. And then, you know, you're seeing like counterculture scenes in the 60s. And since the count counterculture explosion was so voluminous, you're seeing like broadsheets and news sheets that are printed offset on really cheap paper. And these are mushrooming all over America and becoming like a focal point for a movement. Previous to that, you've seen zines coming out of civil rights, out of the anti-nuclear movement. And then of course, you know, in the seventies, when the photocopier becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, um, you start seeing that shift. And that shift obviously means that it's easier to reproduce photographs. Because uh, when you printed Mimeo, you actually had to either do photo stencils, which was which was expensive, or you have to have to draw on the stencil itself, which you have to be really really skilled at. Uh, we did an exhibition a few years ago at PS1 of uh, Lenny Kay's fanzine library. Lenny Kay is the guitar player of the Patti Smith Group and is also like a famous like rock and roll writer. But he started in science fiction fandom, so his entire science fiction zine library went to the University of Miami, and we did an exhibition at uh, PS1 of the zines because they're fucking masterpieces. And the skill that people had in drawing on the Mimeo stencil was like absolutely out of control. So that's like another lost art form in this trajectory. Mm -hmm. So, so do you think that was the time uh, when people seeing started seeing this kind of self-publishing as art or as, as a creative? I still, creative I practice? still think, I still am not positively clear if it is art. Mm -hmm. as, I was, and, I was and, about and, to say and, as and, a creative as, as, a, as a situationist, I'm also kind of repulsed mm -hmm. by the notion of defining any of this as art because art to me is so contaminated by commerce as a concept. Homer Simpson was right that money can be exchanged for goods and services. And unfortunately all of us have to like buy groceries and pay the rent. 
But I think that when it comes to zines and the power of zines, I'd see it much more as something that is political in the Ralph Vanningham sense of the revolution of everyday life, that it is something that becomes simplified and defanged as an art movement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you're seeing in the punk days in the 70s, you know, the photocopier is king, it is immediate communication. And then, you know, if we jump to this thing, you know, this thing sucks. Uh, and one thing that none of us are ready to think about as of yet, but that Guy Debord writes about, Ralph Vanagim writes about, Marshall McLuhan writes about, is that this is not a portal into the world. This is actually a mirror. Mm -hmm. And this is a mirror that always flatters you. Mm. So now the racist reads racist news. The cat lover reads cat lover news. Uh, the Italian ch food chef reads Italian food mm -hmm. chef news. So this is strictly a device of the spectacle. And that means that youth who produce whatever it is, who produce ideas or who produce art or produce communication, they need to do this. Mm -hmm. So, And then you do that. Mm -hmm. And then in what William Gibson calls meat space, mm -hmm. something happens. There's an exchange in meat space. And that is very, very different from if I'm sending you a text message or showing you a cute kitty cat on Instagram or tagging you on mm -hmm. something or, you know, sending you a PDF because this is obviously not an actuality. Mm -hmm. This is like a mirror reflection of the self, which truly diminishes the power of communication. Um, and that is where I think zines are now in the last 20 years, because this is toothsome everyday life stuff. Mm -hmm. And it is communication in meat space. And, you know, Leila and I talk a lot about this because, you know, one of the things that's happening with 8-Ball now is that 8-Ball is becoming a real great focal point for political activism that, you know, more than like 15,000 people find out about demonstrations and acts of activism and acts of protest because of the 8-Ball network. But we don't want 8-Ball to be like an in Instagram channel. Mm -hmm. We want 8-Ball we want to be an actuality that generates activism, you know. And in conjunction with that, you know, Bukhare is totally a business. You know, we've mm -hmm. got to pay the rent. I've got to pay my employees. So we organize and stabilize archives that we sell to museums and academic institutions. But to me, that's also a political act because you can choose what kind of historical narratives that you feel are unpreserved. Mm -hmm. And luckily that I have that kind, the kind of credibility that I can get fancy universities and museums interested in those trajectories. And so, how did you get to that credibility? What's your background? I'm, I'm, I'm old. Yeah? <laughs> and, uh, What's your background? Um, I, moved to, I moved to the US when I was 23. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm 51 now. You're uh, English? Huh? Are you British? No, I'm Swedish originally. Oh, you're Swedish. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I first worked in the music business and as a broadcaster. I had a radio show as a music writer for some music magazines. And then I was a successful record executive. And then I was literally over that. <laughs> I didn't want to stand around in a club at 2 a.m. and talk to 20-year-olds anymore. Um, so I started doing books and exhibitions. The first archive that I built was the Hip Hop History Archive, which is at Cornell University, which is the biggest archive in the world on the history of hip hop, which I think is very, very important. And I think also think it's the most important art form of the end of the 20th century, mm -hmm. you know, counting everything, <laughs> counting pop, counting abstract expressionism. And I think hip hop is much more important. Um, because I think that the power of an art form that simultaneously functions as mass market crap with like Jay-Z and is like global grassroots movement of people who make their own music and their own clothes and their own dancing is really, really poignant. And I think it's a super powerful breeding ground for 21st century thought. So 
you know, that was about 15, 17 years ago. So since then, I've created around 65 archives for and, different universities and museums. And so you just decided to create an archive, or how did... Some, sometimes I start from scratch, mm -hmm. just because I don't see that anybody has done it before. So that's hap what happened with hip-hop. Right now, we're working on the counterculture roots of sustainability, which I'm super fascinated by. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also working on the zine culture of the last 15, 20 years, which I think is really, really important. But sometimes, you know, a poet will die and their family will contact us to ask for help mm -hmm. because the poet will have an attic full of letters and manuscripts and mm -hmm. stuff. Or sometimes it'll be an avant-garde theater group. Sometimes it'll be a political organization. Sometimes it'll be a fine artist. Sometimes mm -hmm. it'll be a record company. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes we represent these people or these estates. Uh, sometimes we buy the archive. Um, sometimes we publish books from the archives. Sometimes we create exhibitions from the archives. You know, it's really, really fun. <laughs> uh, and I think it's important, too, in in that sort of grassroots revolution of everyday life perspective mm -hmm. that I try to have on everything I do. Because, you know, I take, um, especially Raoul Vanigem, very seriously. I take uh, Totality for Kids and Revolution of Everyday Life as real serious cues for conduct in everyday life. Because I think that in that situation, and in the creation of those situations is where you actually alter the trajectory of societal thought. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe even more so now than ever because we have this machine of hyperfragmentation in our hands. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's particularly, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm born in 65, so I've been through the ringer a few times. I, I remember Thatcher, I remember squats. I remember Reagan, you know, mm. I remember Bill Clinton, who was also a crook. <laughs> um, so having a crook in the White House freaks me out. <laughs> and it doesn't super freak me out. It freaks me out, but it's really, really motivating in the same way as my, you know, I was in Paris last week and I'm talking to people who are terrified of Le Pen. And they should be. And disgusted. <laughs> And at the same time, are seeing that as like the red flag, you know, the red handkerchief for the bull. Mm. So it is a time right now where I actually think that we all need to be very, very focused on our conduct and like what kind of message mm -hmm. we send out into the world. And, you know, one of the things that I talked to Dalen and you know, Lele and so forth about is with eight ball, we have the ability to produce a lot of communiques on how to actually teach young people to disrupt mm -hmm. and to organize, which I'm really interested in, that I've always been interested in, you know, ever since I was 17 years old and involved in squats. Yeah, so you're talking about teaching. Can you tell us about your uh, lecture uh, activity and the uh, workshops that you um, the, teach? Uh, at Yale, I do a week-long master's class, which happens every two or three years. So it's grad students, and it'll be 10 to 20 grad students who, for an, a really intense week, uh, will learn about how the book arts and publishing and distribution has changed after World War II. And, uh, you know, if you are, I'll give you a couple of good examples. Um, it's like one of the gals who took my class last time uh, was from Zimbabwe. And she was seeing how Mugabe was in real time trying to destroy the music culture of dissent in Zimbabwe. So what she needed to learn was how to gain the trust of people who had made music in Zimbabwe since the 80s, how to preserve their cassette tapes and posters and notebooks and how to store them and how to smuggle them out of Zimbabwe. 
So we did a workshop about that. Um, there was another girl who uh, was doing her master's thesis on Cirque du Soleil. And I don't know if you know about Cirque du Soleil, but they're like fucking Scientologists. They won't tell you anything. They won't talk to journalists. They're kind of like a weird cult. And they're like, they're assholes. <laughs> so she wanted to know how she could study when the focus of her study would just shut her out. And how to find like these sort of paper trails and information trails in like parallel settings. And then there were other people who had run into dead ends in when they were studying topics online and how you best actually go to primary source materials. If that primary source material is a publication or if that primary source material is a person who you take an oral history from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I also teach like oral history techniques, like how to best take oral histories. So that's kind of what I've done at Yale. At uh, Cornell, I have been lecturing on different forms of grassroots activism, like once in a while. And I, I would do that for like English students, music students, history students, you know, sort of whatever's clever. Um, at uh, Rare Book School at the University of Virginia, it's much more formal. Uh, it's a week-long course uh, training uh, university librarians, uh, curators, and the custodians of rare book departments at universities and museums how to deal with all the shit that's been going down for the last 50, 60 years. How do you identify a zine, you know? What do you do if the staples are so rusty that they're wrecking the paper? How do you tell the difference between something that's a silk screen or that's printed mm. off set or that's mimeographed or that's photocopied? How do you tell the difference between a 50-year-old photocopy and a 5-year-old photocopy? You know, how do you preserve VHS tapes? How do you preserve cassette tapes? Mm -hmm. How do you preserve the worst of all, which is Pro Tools files or CDRs? You know, <laughs> how do you do that? And yeah. then also, how do you identify and build bibliographies when you're in your situation, mm -hmm. where you actually have to start this from scratch? So. <laughs> yes, so can you tell us about uh, this archive that you're building, which is very close to what I'm doing? Uh, there are art zines somehow? Do you call them that way? Uh, hold on, I just got a... I just got a... My Uh, one sec. No doggies. Uh, so I'm really I'm interested in scene culture. I've been publishing zines since I was 15 years old. You know, back in the day, punk scenes, science fiction zines, art zines, um, and I actually love the zine as a medium of communication. Um, and I always thought it was really, really interesting to see the resurgence in zine culture that came out of the digital age, because the digital age is so unpleasant and non-toothsome and, you know, it's just no fun. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh, you know, it's like, I've, I've known people in this community for like a long time. It's, uh, probably the most sort of notorious, famous person that makes zines is of course Dash Snow, who died uh, eight years ago, something like that. And we were friends. So I had his zines. And uh, Phil and I actually did an exhibition of all of uh, Dash's zines at MoCA a few years ago, where I published a bibliography of Dash's zines, which was kind of a fun thing to do. Because it's, it's odd that you're actually working in the field of bibliography with like handmade zines and you know I was a deep admirer of uh, Phil's project with the Mark Gonzalez zines and I supplied him with as many gone zines as I could possibly find um, and you know it's like I work with Leo Fitzpatrick and you know I'm a close friend with the Templetons and so forth so I know a lot of the people are like the most famous people working in zines but that in turn has led me to kind of feverishly try to collect as many unfamous zines as possible. Because I, I trained as a historian. So as a historian, I don't think that the Rolling Stones are very interesting. Mm -hmm. But I think 
10,000 bands who wanted to sound like the Rolling Stones <laughs> in 1965, and their history and who they were is extremely interesting, because I think that that is how history works. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm a great admirer of Edward Gibbon, who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, uh, which I think is like literally one of the most powerful books that you can read in a lifetime. And what's extraordinary with Gibbon, and which really, really changed the trajectory of how history is written, is that he saw it that history is not only the kings and the presidents and the great battles and the great texts, but it's also the chaotic myriad of everyday life narratives underneath that. And I think that that's the most important takeaway that you can get from reading The Climb Fall of the Roman Empire. Um, so I am also, I've always been a huge fan of the Italian microhistory tradition of the 1970s and 1980s, which for some reason completely f fell out of favor and nobody cares about anymore in like historian circles. But when, as far as microhistory goes, you know, say that in an archive or in a library, you find 300 interviews with nurses in Lyon in 1830 about what their lives were like and how they thought and you know what their experience was and so forth if you have something like that you can apply your understanding of that to you know people who worked in a fish canning factory in Greenland in 1920 it was a similar setting because there's so much commonality in all of this so with this you know obviously who are we kidding here this is predominantly white and middle class. But the power of this publishing trajectory just grows exponentially the more of these things that you see. So right now, I think that this is around 3,000, 4,000 zines. Uh, it has not been collected with any parameters of aesthetics or any kind of you know, quality of execution or like big names versus small names. Um, it has more been collected with the idea of it being a starting point. So if this would exist in, in an institutional library and that institutional library would continue to build on this collection for 10, 15 years, then I think you would have a narrative that would be truly meaningful for scholarly work because one of the most pretentious things about working from this perspective is that I'm not that worried about how we think about this five years from now, but I'm very worried about how we're going to think about this 300 years from now. And one of my big epiphanies when it comes to this is a personal interest of mine is radical thought during the English Civil War. So, you know, I'm really interested in the Ranthers and the Levelers and, you know, Christian anarchism in the 16th and 17th century, which you know, if I get a little smarter, I might write about that in this life. Uh, the reason that we know so much about that is that the librarians at the Bodleian at Oxford collected these broadsides and pamphlets and tracts in real time. And these are publications that were extremely critical of the king of, you know, the priest class, of the government. You know, there's a famous tract that, of course, exists at the Bodleian that describes Oxford and Cambridge as the two eyes of the great war of ba Babylon that have to be poked out. So I am really, really interested in the library as a depository of radical thought, too, mm -hmm. which I think is really important. Mm -hmm. So do you think that this type of material says something about uh, what contemporary art or what the state of art is today? Or do you see it think only politically? If, to me, it, it's, it's all about personal and collective politics. You know, it's art, art gets more and more complicated to think about the older you get. You're in your mid-20s now? <laughs> I'm 33. Oh, you're 33. You look, you look young. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so you're over that hump. So you are now slowly but steadily expanding on what you think art means in a society. Maybe. Yeah. Um, 
I think I really, really think that like pop and impressionism has fucked shit up hmm. uh, because I think that that means that the wealthy consumerist dilettante can drive aesthetic narratives. Mm. And that's, you know, why absolute crap like Richard Prince goes for millions. Or, mm. you know, funny crap like Andy Warhol yeah. goes, goes for millions. That's what goes on even Caswell. <laughs> yeah, but, and also it's like, I didn't until quite real uh, recently know about the super horrible term wall power. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? No. <laughs> so fucked up. They talk about it in Los Angeles. That's when your friends and neighbors come into your house and see the wall power of the artwork that you've bought. And, you know, that is just, just the merchant class and the bourgeoisie who have actually hijacked uh, the aesthetic experience. So, and, you know, the guy who painted this is our, my buddy Ben Morea who uh, was one of the leading uh, anarchists in New York in the 60s, who quit painting because he was so disgusted by pop. And uh, who, one of the many wonderful things he did was he shut down MoMA in 1966 with his anarchist group, the Up Against the Wall motherfuckers. And the way that he did that was that he sent a letter to MoMA saying that he was going to shut down MoMA. MoMA completely freaked out. 80 cops showed up with barricades. <laughs> And then Ben went up to MoMA and put up a sign on the door that said closed. <laughs> um, so art as a tool of communication? Yeah, fucking A, great. You know, uh, art as something that we use to communicate identity is great. But the whole, like, junior executive wanting the corner office, I'm pretty fucking bored by, you know, where people are predominantly seeing it as a career or, you know, I love every one of my artist friends who can pay the rent by being an artist. I think that's absolutely great. But the gallery game, you know, it's, it's creepy. There's no way around mm -hmm. it. And it also cheapens the visual experience as much as this does mm -hmm. so i don't know if that answers your question i think so yeah. <laughs> thank you good <laughs>